All right. So uh, about Huntsman Wildlife, we are an ODNR or Ohio Department of Natural Resource licensed company. There are some operators in the Cincinnati area who are not licensed. Um, you'll sometimes see them on Facebook Marketplace next door saying, oh, my, my neighbor can help take care of your raccoon and stuff like that. The problem with it is that there are a lot of laws and regulations in Ohio when it comes to our wildlife control. Things people aren't aware of. You cannot transport wildlife from a chipmunk to a raccoon. If you take it off your property, the only option you have is euthanasia. If you release it in a park, if you release it in the woods, if you release it down at the creek, that's misdemeanor. And if anyone finds out, you can be charged with that, which is not good. The reasons we do that is, lack of better terms, disease. The animals in your attic or in your crawl space or you know in your backyard might have a disease such as distemper, uh, parvo, you know anything else. And if you take that animal in your backyard and then you transplant that out to Ten Mile Creek or down by the Ohio River, and that population doesn't have that illness, that's how it spreads. The other thing and I try to let people know is if, how many people like to go out to eat dining in like OTR, you know, patio dining? Okay, imagine you're out there, right? Somebody comes by in a white van, puts a hood over your head, throws you in a van, drops you off in Belize. You don't have your cell phone, you don't have your wallet, you don't know the language, you don't know where food is, you don't know where water is, you have no established shelter. You are doing the exact same thing to wildlife when you just pick it up and drop it off somewhere. That population that's already there of raccoons or opossums or skunks, they're established. So there's going to be infighting, there's going to be strife. And University of Berkeley did a study about four or five years ago, 75% of animals released do not make it 72 hours. It's actually more ethical, and that's a word we use. We don't use humane in our company. We use ethical. It's more ethical to euthanize that animal if you're not going to re-release it on the property. So just something to think about. Uh, like I said earlier, we have a strong focus on exclusion and prevention. I don't want to be pulling animals out of your home. I don't want to be trapping animals in your backyard. Three or four times a month, I get a call. Ryan, I've got raccoons eating at my bird feeder. I tell them one thing and one thing only, put the bird feeder away. That raccoon's not doing anything wrong. There's no reason for me to trap a raccoon in your backyard. If it gets in your house, if it gets in your crawl space, if it's a threat or a danger to your pets, your family, your kids, at that point we'll intervene. But I'm not gonna deal with animals that are doing exactly what animals are supposed to do. If you put a wildlife feeder, because that's all bird feeders are, in your backyard, you're going to have wildlife. So that's why, like I said, strong focus on exclusion and prevention. Um, I am a veteran. Uh, if you see there, that beautiful woman in the kayak next to me is my wife. We work hand in hand. That was a big uh, muskrat job we were doing for a family over um, in Bethel. They were having problems where the muskrats were chewing at the aeration cables or aeration lines and the cables on their um, pond fountains. Mm -hmm causing hundreds of you know dollars in damage to that and then they were um they have a dam the way it was set up and so the, when they would burrow into that dam they weakened the dam so we had to do some mitigation and control there again i'm not just going to go trap muskrats and you know nail their hides to the side of my barn but in this case because it was causing damage because it was a danger to the family and their crops and all that stuff we took care of it uh, and then community events we are huge on community events. Stuff like this, coming out into the community, letting you guys know about the wildlife, what we can do to, in essence, coexist, but still keep them on our home. We support a lot of community events, especially down in the New Richmond area. We actually live up in an Ohio township, but I kind of claim fame to New Richmond. Mm -hmm. um, many of you might have seen uh, some of the stuff we've done in the past, uh, inflatable race on the beachhead during River Days last mm -hmm. year. Uh, we did a, uh, like donation drive when there were the um, tornadoes over in Kentucky and we drove a big U-Haul worth of stuff out there. So we're not, I'm not in it for a yacht and a Cayman. I mean, obviously I have to make some money. I have to put a roof over my head, food on my table. Um, but we strongly believe that there's been a downturn in the past 20 years of community businesses. You know, you, you look at the community and go, yes, that's a revenue source, but what else can I put back? And that's where programs and presentations like these 
are important to us. Now, me and myself, I fell into this industry. After I got done working for Uncle Sam, uh, my last year of my contract in the Army was as a recruiter. I realized if I could sell the Army in 2005 to parents and high school students, I could sell just about anything. So I got a job with a family business um, back in Minneapolis selling bobcats, big bulldozers, excavators, skid steers. Did that for three years, it was great. Had a fantastic time selling heavy equipment to builders and excavators and all that. And then the housing market collapsed. And nobody's buying big equipment if they're not building big things. So I had to find a new job. I responded to an ad in a uh, penny shopper, uh, which goes to show you I am 40. I'm not quite a young guy. There were still paper penny shoppers when I was looking for a job. It was a route sales position for a pest control company. Got into pest control, realized I loved it. Um, sent a uh, email to one of my high school teachers while I was at that first pest control company saying, hey, Nobody told me I could do this. They said cops, they said lawyers, they said doctors, they said teachers. Nobody said I could go outside and play with wildlife all day long. And so I've been in the industry for a long time. Uh, I'm originally from Minnesota. That's where the Canada South accent's coming from. I'm picking that up. <laughs> the last four years I lived in Minnesota, it was my job to keep the Mall of America mouse free. That's all I did. I woke up in the morning at four o'clock in the morning I was at the mall by five, from 5 a.m. until 11 a.m. I was walking around the Mall of America, checking traps, servicing, and then I was doing back-end stuff. Um, one of the fun things I always tell people, the Mall of America at its current phase right now is 7.7 .7 million square feet. Only 3.5 of that is public. Wow. So if you think about that, there's almost the same amount of space mm -hmm. in the backside of the mall when it comes to the hallways, docks, uh, sub-levels, it was a fantastic job. I'm still disappointed about uh, signing the NDA. I wouldn't write anything to disparage the mall, but there are a lot of great stories. Um, there's one specific story about a high-end retailer that literally I was chasing a mouse around, running around the dressing room area, trying to catch it two hours before they opened on Black Friday. <laughs> yeah, it was a fun time. Um, I do have certifications from Purdue University in urban pest management. Uh, it's not a degree, it's correspondence courses, it's an industry thing. I've probably got about 70, 80 hours into my Purdue certifications. Uh, and then I have been a licensed holder in Minnesota, Wisconsin, Iowa, South Dakota, North Dakota, Indiana, Kentucky, and Illinois. Obviously now also Ohio, um, but I only hold a wildlife license in Ohio currently. Um, those are all my pest control licenses. I have gone through multiple trainings with multiple universities here in the Midwest, and then there's a bunch of other accreditations when it comes to third-party auditing systems food safety because my pest control experience when I first started was big plants. How many people have seen the uh, TV show, How It's Made? I've lived that life for four years. That's all I did was go around all these factories and plants and manufacturing areas and food producers. And it was so much fun being like, so this is how Cheerios, like I've seen giant, <laughs> big, you know, five foot by five foot bags of just the marshmallows from, um, uh, Lucky Charms. Oh, wow. Mm. Yeah. So I've seen a lot. I've done a lot. Um, I got very tired of the bug life. I don't like cockroaches, spiders, <laughs> bed bugs, termites. Um, and I realized when, when I wanted to start my own company, instead of going into actually pest control, I decided I'm just going to deal with vertebrates. So my rule is four legs or fewer. Over four legs, call one of my buddies in a pest control room. But if it's got four legs or fewer, I can help you out to take care of it. All right, enough about Huntsman and me. Let's talk about the bats in your backyard. Now, Ohio is home to about 11 different bat species. Southwestern Ohio, we have three main ones that are going to be most prevalent. We do have a couple others that show up here and there migratory wise, um, but our three main bats are going to be the little brown bat, the big brown bat, and the Indiana bat. Now, they did a really creative job naming all these. It took a lot of work to figure it out. So the little brown bat is going to be the one, more than likely, that's in your home. Big brown bat we'll deal with on occasion. Uh, really, on this side of the world, when we're on the east side of Cincinnati here, we tend to deal with big browns more in stuff like large barns, sheds, 
uh, grain areas, stuff like that. Indiana bat, we deal with it on occasion over here. We see them oddly enough around a lot of golf courses. Uh, around golf course communities, we tend to find the Indiana bats, um, but they're more of a cave dwelling bat, so we'll go into that in the future. But those are our three kind of main bats you're gonna be dealing with in your backyard or on your home. Now, the little brown bat is exactly what it sounds like. It's a little brown bat. The difference is between the little brown bat and the Indiana bat are going to be the coloring of the body, the, the luster almost of their coat, and then you'll notice their ears. On the little brown bat, you've got a very pointed ear profile, and the snout is more of a brownish color. Um, just like most bats, their diet is mainly going to be night flying insects. Um, you'll notice in the list of all three of these, you don't see a lot of mosquitoes. Mosquitoes are not a huge diet factor for bats. So when you see things online about put a bat house up in your home because it'll help control the mosquitoes, we'll go into it a little sooner or a little later, but it's not quite the large diet um, around here that they will be. They're, they're going after, you know, midges, moss, um, plant hoppers. They love those little plant hoppers, those little green, you know, kind of leaf-shaped bugs that hop on you. Um, and then for the little brown, their roosts are commonly going to be man-made structures, caves, and tree hollows. Uh, you're not going to find them behind bark as much as you're going to find them in hollows. So if you've got some older trees in your property or dead trees, uh, usually what happens is a circle of life happens, the tree dies off and the bark falls off. Once the bark falls off, the insects get into it. Once the insects get into it, the woodpeckers show up and start creating holes. Once those holes are done and they've either moved on or they've you know, ate all the food, then the bats move in. Now you'll find if you come to other presentations, that circle of life is something we always talk about. Um, you know, one of the things we, if you follow us on social media, we rail against wildlife feeders and bird feeders. It's just between April and October, there's no need for them in your backyard because again, that circle of life, you put the, the bird feeder or the wildlife feeder and that seed ends up feeding the chipmunks, the mice, the rats, which end up feeding the raccoons, the opossums, the snakes, which end up feeding the coyotes and fox. And so if you don't want one of those on your property, then you don't want bird feeders on your property. Same thing with bats. Bats will go into dead trees at some point. So if you have a tree die on your property, you don't have, need to address it right away. But once you notice that the woodpeckers are gone, then the bats are gonna move in. Big brown bat, uh, again, the difference is going to be in the snout. Your snout's gonna be more of a dark black color. They're much larger in size. By much larger, I mean hold out your thumb. In a roosting position, this is a little brown bat. When its wings are folded in, now put two thumbs together, that's a big brown bat. So it's not that much of a difference. Um, comparatively, it's a little bit bigger, um, but their wingspan. Once you get that wingspan, you're looking at a full foot of, of wingspan, where a, bit, a little brown bat's gonna be anywhere from eight to 10 inches. Um, a big brown bat's gonna have a much bigger wingspan, but when they're folded up and in a roosting position, it's pretty much two thumbs together. Their diet, they're actually gonna go for more of the ground um, insects. So you're talking about beetles, scarabs, uh, stuff like stink bugs. So people who hate stink bugs, big browns are a big feeder on those. Um, and then again, moths and leaf hoppers. Now they are going to um, roost behind loose bark and small ca cavities in larger trees. Um, and then the big brown will also go into the conifers. Most of the time, your bats are gonna like deciduous trees, um, mainly because it's easier to fly through them. You know, so they have to fly in between the branches. It's easier to do that with a deciduous tree when you have a big leaf or a canopy. When you're dealing with conifers, um, such as pines, uh, cypress, and stuff like that, for whatever reason, the big browns love it. And it might have to do with the fact that that bark tends to peel out, open up, and that's where the bats will be. Now, if you've noticed, I've talked about trees twice now as bat habitats. It's gonna become important to realize that Trees are a huge habitat in our area for bats. And then the Indiana bat. Uh, like I said with this one, um, instead of the, it's the same exact size almost as a little brown bat. You'll notice their um, snout is more of a pinkish color. 
their fur is more of a, a muted brown or gray, and it's almost dustier. It looks like the bird, the bird, the bat's been in a dusty environment. It doesn't have that sheen and that luster that the little brown has. Around the same size as the little brown, um, and then there are, you know, again, moths, beetles, um, mosquitoes for the Indiana bat. That's the first time that's going to show up here. Um, but for their habitats, they're not really so much a structure invading bat. They will end up there, especially the single males, because the males um, tend to be a little bit more solitary. The females will tend to congregate more, and that's where you're gonna find them in caves. Uh, we don't have much for caves on our side of the world here in Cincinnati, um, but there are a couple in the area, especially across the river, um, and that's where we have to be aware of. Threats to bat populations. Number one is lack of knowledge. It's not knowing what you're dealing with, why you're dealing with it, um, and how it ended up being an issue. I think Casey and Natalie and all the other library group um, will absolutely agree with me when I say, if you're going to search things online, do not trust.com. There's a fantastic website called huntsmanwildlife.com, but I am not a biologist. I'm not a state expert. I am not, you know, working for the ODNR. Everything I write, I try to be factual, but that's not what I do. I'm not a trusted resource. .edu .gov. Regardless of your political beliefs, the, the information on those websites tend to be more up-to-date and more accurate, especially your extension offices. Um, I, I, when I moved here six years ago to the Cincinnati area, I was surprised at how little the extension offices are used, especially um, by people who have properties or gardeners or are interested in wildlife or pest control. You, the local extension offices that run through the universities are a plethora of knowledge. And just like here at the library where they're more than willing, you know, we've got all these books available for you guys to check out afterwards. Same thing at the extension office. If you call your local extension office and say, hey, I need to know more about why I have bats in this area, or you have a noxious weed issue on your property, or you're having problems with your garden, the extension offices that are run by the universities are fantastic and they're always, always happy to help. Um, attending local events uh, at those offices, again, um, I'm not 100% sure um, how Claremont County runs their extension with their events. I believe they post them on the website. They're not too often. Um, and I'm kind of trying to you know, convince them to do more of this stuff to help people understand. But you know, even uh, we've got the Claremont County Fair coming up. You know, I know that they're big out there when it comes to having information booth, check in with them and say, hey, you know, what do you guys have for educational opportunities, volunteer opportunities, all that stuff. Um, and then wildlife rescue rehabbers that specialize in bats. Ohio runs a very interesting wildlife rehabber and rescue program. We don't do anything with that. We are a trapper. We cannot be associated with rehabbers and rescues because they see it as a conflict of interest. There are certain certifications and levels at which a wildlife rehabber or a rescuer goes. They start out with pretty much just birds. They can take in baby birds, fledgling stuff like that. And as they grow in experience and knowledge and certifications, they grow up into more um, involved animals, larger vertebrates, stuff like bats, um, raptors, coyotes, deer. Those are kind of the upper echelon of wildlife rescues. So just because somebody on Facebook or LinkedIn or next door says, I run a rescue, there are two or three actual licensed rehabbers and rescues here in Claremont County. But if you go and you post on a Facebook or, you know, next door, I have a baby bird, what do I do? You're going to have about 40 people say, I rescue wildlife. Don't get me started, but yeah. Um, <laughs> and then uh, I don't know who our new guy is. Um, every county has a division of wildlife representative. Some people call him a game warden. Some people call him couple other names from some hunters and fish I know. Um, we used to have a, a great guy named Gus. He got moved to Adams County. I'm not 100% sure who our new wildlife rep is, um, but again, you can go to the ODNR, contact them and say, hey, I'm out here in Claremont County. I have an issue. They'll get a conservation officer or a wildlife professional out, excuse me, to help you out with your issue. Um, and sometimes, you know, clients call us and I'll say, 
that's not something you want to pay me for because the ODNR will help you out with it. No need to pay me $500 for me to show up to take care of something that the ODNR is going to give you the direction on how to do. So when it comes to bats, sometimes um, contacting the ODNR uh, Division of Wildlife is a good, good resource. Um, they make all of my rules. Everything that I do for my business is regulated under the Division of Wildlife for the ODNR. Um, so kind of same thing when it comes to bats. And then the books. Uh, Natalie and Casey were nice enough to uh, collect some of the books here in the Claremont County you know, catalog uh, for their libraries for bats and information like that. There are some, you know, obviously more juvenile um, focused information there, but there are some other great opportunities. I, I, I not here to necessarily sell the library, um, but I'm sure Casey's not going to complain. Not gonna if, if there's ever anything you want to know, Google's great, but like I said, .edu .gov, but the county has these buildings and they're kind of throughout the county, they're called libraries and they are full of information that you don't have to weed through to figure out what's reputable, what's good. And, and the people in those buildings spend the entire day looking at these books, figuring out what to do. So please, please, please make sure, take advantage of the library system. That's why we're doing our presentations here. I'm not doing any community center. I'm not getting a, you know, a conference center at, you know, Abby's farm or whatever, getting a conference room. I wanted it to be something where people could be done with the presentation and go out and get more resources on the way home. Um, and then, yeah, seminars like these, these are fun. Uh, we committed to an entire year or the rest of the year here, we're gonna go through bats, we're gonna go through coyotes and fox, we're gonna go through squirrels. I think we have raccoons, we have mice and rodents, pretty much if it's got four legs or fewer and it's in Ohio, we're gonna be doing a presentation one on Saturdays here. The other thing is, um, declining populations have to do with available habitat. And I'm not talking about subdivisions. I'm talking about Joe Smith, doesn't like the way that tree looks, so he cuts it down in the middle of June. If you can, do not cut down trees between April and October, especially large, mature trees with loose bark. It, it's, it's one of those that, uh, not just the bats, but obviously you have the birds and, and all that, but there have been cases in this state where people have knocked down trees killed off colonies of bats, and the Ohio Department of, uh, or Division of Wildlife has charged them for restitution for those bats. The last one I heard about was $65 per bat. If, if the tree doesn't need to come down, um, you know, don't cut it down until October. Um, the other thing is, one of the ways, and I always tell people, I'm a call away, the ODNR, you can have them come out, verify whether or not there's bats in that tree, but if you do need to cut down a large tree with loose bark in between April and October, make sure to get it checked out by somebody other than an arborist. You know, arborist wants to pay you, or wants you to pay them to cut down the tree. I'm not saying that they don't know about bats, but there are a lot of tree companies that aren't even aware that between April and October, you have roosting situations for bats you can get charged for it. So again, contacting a wildlife professional, contacting the Ohio Department of Natural Resources, I wanna cut down this tree, can somebody verify that I don't have a colony in here? Support green spaces in the community. Um, you know, again, I, I, I run a small business, I'm a capitalist at heart, so I know for sure that, you know, growing and, and you know, making communities bigger and bolder is not necessarily a bad thing, um, but ensuring that there are green spaces. Concrete jungles cause problems. Um, I was just talking with a client yesterday, last night at nine o'clock, we had set a uh, wireless uh, cellular trail camera underneath his porch, because something was digging a hole. We wanted to figure out what exactly it was. And one night we saw two raccoons, one a possum, a skunk, and a bunch of mice. And he was like, I live in the middle of Cincinnati. Where are all these coming from? And I told him, I said, population numbers don't change with the amount of concrete you have. Where that population lives absolutely changes. Wildlife doesn't see a house. They see a very oddly shaped tree. That's all it is. A house is nothing more than a very oddly shaped tree to them. And so when you take out all of the natural trees and you replace them with houses, that wildlife's still gonna be there because, and if not higher populations, because of things like trash, wildlife feeders, people leaving you know, animal feed like bird seed, 
uh, cat food, dog food out at night, stuff like that. Those wildlife numbers are bolstered. You know, um, 10 block radius of Cincinnati, you're gonna have the same number of raccoons that I have on my eight and a half acre hobby farm out in Ohio Township. It, it all has to do with food resources. So supporting green spaces keeps them out of your homes, still gives them a spot. Uh, barns, sheds is another one, especially, gosh, we've had some big windstorms this year. Um, a lot of the older sheds and barns in the area have become structurally weakened and so people want to tear them down. Getting those uh, inspected by a wildlife professional or the Ohio DNR and saying, hey, I want to tear this barn down and I want to tear the shed down can somebody come and make sure I don't have a colony of bats? Because again, if you're looking at, you know, a big 20 by 40 barn that's two stories tall and you're looking for a thumbprint size, dark brown animal, you might not see it. And that's where professionals like me, who know where to look, what to look for, looking for droppings, looking for, you know, the SIBO marks, stuff like that, we'll be able to tell if they're in there. Um, we're gonna take a quick second. We're gonna go over the worst Thing that ever happened to the internet when it comes to bats. How many of you have thought about putting a bat house on or near your property? How many of you have over five acres on that property? All right, you are allowed to have a bat house. Everybody else, no. You see this bat house? This bat house can hold maybe 15 to 20 bats, little brown bats. Okay, you're gonna put this up on your house. You're gonna get 15 to 20 bats in it in one season. And next season, those 15 to 20 bats are gonna turn into 45 to 50. It's gonna to be too big for this bat house. Take a wild guess where they're gonna go. In your house. Absolutely. <laughs> three times this year, three times I've been called out for bat work. And there is a bat house hanging off the chimney, just like this, yeah, hanging off the yeah. side of the house hanging off the barn that's right behind the house. And we're like, I don't know why the bats are here. It, it's, it's the fact that bat houses are great, but you want a giant bat house that's gonna hold the number of bats or have it at minimum one acre away from any structure. <laughs> so if you have more than one acre, just like you do, put a couple bat houses out in the woods away from the barn, away from the house, you're golden. The rest of you, I'm sorry, you don't need a bat house. Um, the bat house or bird feeder? Yeah, I know, I'm, I'm super fun, aren't I? <laughs> but we know this way to it, so. Yes. Now, uh, some of you might have heard or seen in the past couple years something called white nose syndrome. Yeah. Really, white nose syndrome isn't going to affect much more than um, your cave dwelling bats. Uh, it's kind of like, you know, people are saying about the, Verm the Vermoa, Vermoa mite or bees. Um, it's a very select group. Yes, it is absolutely disastrous to our bat populations. Um, but the best ways you can protect against white nose syndrome is first off, if you don't need to go into a cave, don't go into a cave. Secondly, um, if you are going to go in, make sure to decontaminate yourself before going into that cave. Uh, white nose is a fungus. And so it needs that dark, damp environment to grow. Um, and so making sure that the caves, especially protected caves, are fine um, and we're not introducing new issues to it is, is the best way to help bats when we're dealing with um, white nose syndrome. And again, we don't have too many large caves around here that um, are going to hold bats. Um, but as you walk up and down, you know, if you're a nature lover or hiker and you're going through some of the woods or whatever and you do find an outcropping, you don't need to go into the cave. I always tell people, just try and stay out of them. Now granted, I'm 40 years old and I have the heart of a 14 year old. If I see a dark hole in the ground, I'm gonna try and go into it. Uh, but it's just one of those that, you know, know that if you're gonna do that, leave a lot of your gear. Um, don't try and, you know, add problems to that area. And then illegal and improper eviction and exclusion. Bats are federally protected. Federally protected. Federally protected, which means if you do bad things to bats, big, big Uncle Sam wants, wants to punish you. Um, in Ohio, do not exclude bats between May 16th and July 31st. 
that is something due to maternal colonies. Um, bats are just like every other mammal. They have babies. Those babies need to grow up big and strong. In order to do that, they, uh, the females all congregate in something called maternal colonies, where you'll have anywhere from you know, a half dozen to hundreds of females will take over one area. They will all have their young in that area, and then those young need to grow up. When a bat's first born, it is not capable of flight. So the mothers go out every night to feed. They bring back food to the young. If you exclude the bats, if you kick them out of your home and all those adult bats fly away and they can't get back into your, those young, all those young are gonna perish. First and foremost, that's a horrible thing for the bat. Secondly, there's nothing in the world you want more or you want less than 60 to 100 dead baby bats up in your attic because that smell will make you live in a hotel for two weeks. Um, also, I see it all the time. Um, don't exclude bats when evening temps are below 45 degrees. Um, they're, they're, they're a very small animal. They lose body heat quickly. And so they don't tend to do well in the cold and colder areas. So if you are gonna kick bats out of your home, make sure evening temps are consistently over 45 degrees. Um, otherwise, it's again, a death warrant for the animal. And then you cannot harm, molest, or injure the bats in the process. Really, the general rule of thumb is do not touch the bat. If you can find a way to do it without touching the bat, that is the way that is preferred. Uh, we use one-way devices. We'll go into that in a second. Um, but we don't physically go up in the attic and pick out each individual bat and then release it outside. They leave on their own volition. Um, we provide, we seal up everything around the home and give them one or two ways to get out of home and that's it. And then 10 to 14 days later, we, we go up in the attic, make sure the bats are gone. Um, but we don't touch any bats in the process because they are very delicate creatures. Now, uh, there's, because they are federally protected, I do not have an example of a little brown bat, but I'll let you guys pass this around. As you see, this is a juvenile of um, a South American bat, but you can see they're very delicate, tiny animals. Um, and so, any sort of mishandling is going to cause a problem. Um, the membranes on their wings are very, very thin. They tear easily. Their legs and arms are very short, uh, very fragile, and their bodies, and, and you know, the idea that they are a mouse with wings is very true. They have very small, very fragile bones. Um, so, I am not at all against a well-researched and educated homeowner doing their own exclusion work. Um, but if you're not comfortable doing it yourself, if you don't think you can do it properly, then I do say hire a professional. Now, there are two most expensive things clients can hire me for is raccoon removals and bat removals. It's not cheap to have a professional get bats out of your home. I have yet to do, to do one for less than $4,000. It is very expensive because, um, you guys see those green pens on, on your table here? Mm -hmm. That's how wide, a quarter inch, that's all they need, a quarter inch to get in. And so I'm looking around your home for all those gaps, crevices, voids that they can get into and we have to seal all the two of those. So it takes time and a lot of effort. So what are we doing when we get in our home? Common places, you're gonna see bats that are gonna enter a structure are listed here. Now, every time I speak of definitives, Mother Nature loves to prove me wrong, so I don't say this is the only way to do it, uh, but commonly your soffits, fascia, gutters, drip edge, and your chimney are the top four. That's where you're gonna get a majority of your bats coming into your home. Now, you will occasionally get them into rooftop um, venting and gable vents, and then utility entrances. Depending on how your house is built, you have either um, box vents on the top of your roof, or in this example, you have something called a ridge vent. Ridge vent is commonly one of the entrances. This is a metal ridge vent. Um, it's, got a, it's supposed to have a plug on the end, but if you look in there, down the end of that, that goes right into the attic space. Whoa, what happened here? Well, I broke it now. There we go. So um, ridge vents, the, the metal ridge vents with those end caps tend to be a, a very common entry points, not just for bats, 
but you get birds in there, you get mice, all that fun stuff. And then, I gotta quit doing that. Right over on the corner here, that's something that without getting up on a 28 foot ladder, nobody would have seen. This was on a home over in Price Hill, um, very small little hole about the size of, you know, the bottom of my pop can here that just what happened was the water wasn't diverting off the roof well enough and it was starting to degrade the wood and the wood had started to rot out and the bugs had gotten into it and then the woodpeckers got into it, opened that up and then the bats got into it. Like I was telling you, it's all a circle life situation. One thing leads to another. In this situation in the bottom here, that was raccoons. They had raccoons that had ripped open um, their roof line to get in and um, they got the raccoons out, but they forgot to seal things up and then they got bats. And then this is storm damage. I always tell people, now this is very, 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 very old storm damage that was left for a long time. But I always tell people after every high wind event, every single one over 20 miles an hour wind, the next day go outside, check your roof, check your soffits, check your fascia. So um, if I was to turn off all the lights in this room and this TV and spin you around three times, your eyes would be immediately directed to the light going underneath the doors because we're human beings. We survive in light. Everything else on this earth loves dark, small, little holes. That's where they're safe. They're safe from predators. They're safe from the environment. So any dark, crevice, any hole, any void is going to attract things like bats, squirrels, raccoons, um, mice, snakes. So any darkness you want to make sure is, is dealt with. So on the fascia, I've highlighted it here in case you don't know what they are. They're usually the portions that trim out your home. You're going to want to make sure they're still flush. And again, no gaps or crevices, one and a quarter inch wide. And for your soffits, which are gonna run underneath the, the lip or the edge of your roof, make sure it's seated in the J channel. When that comes out of the J channel, which is kind of the, the trim they use to hold up the soffit, it's easily pushed up with wind um, and they can crawl right up there. I've seen bats where the, the, fit, the soffit looks like it's flush, but the bat will land on a structure and then just squeeze itself in because it's not seated in the J channel. It looked like it was fine, but it wasn't. Same things with your gutters or your drip edge. So when, when they're pulled away or when they're not secure exactly and, and there's still a gap, they're gonna land right on top of the roof and they're gonna crawl right back in and under and get in there. So making sure, that, again, no gaps, no crevices, bigger than a quarter inch wide. And then also after every storm and every window event, make sure your gutters are doing the job they're supposed to. As you saw in the earlier photo, it is common, common, common that backups of water or poor water management on the roof that lead to rot will lead to other wildlife issues. So making sure that the water is getting off your roof in an efficient way and isn't affecting the fascia, the soffit, stuff like that is going to prevent wildlife from getting back in. And your rooftop chimneys, make sure they're in good condition, properly seated, make sure all bolts and fasteners are in place and no gaps or crevices bigger than a quarter inch wide. If they do happen to get into, geez Louise, too busy there. If they do happen to get into the home, you're gonna be looking to verify how they're getting in. Again, homes are big, even if you only have a you know, small little rambler, there's still a lot of places they can get in. Commonly for bats, the easiest way to tell are you're going to see staining around the access point. So all of that brown or blackish material, that is a combination of dirt, debris, and something called sebaceous oils. Bats, mice, some other animals, they don't sweat like you and I do. So in order to keep their skin and coat moisturized, they secrete something called sebaceous fluid, or it's an oil. It's really not that gross, but what happens is it picks up the dirt and the debris in the environment, and they get that stuck to them. So then when they squeeze in and out of places, that sebaceous oil and that dirt and debris gets left behind. So over time, after repeated use, people like me and my job see that and go, bingo. It's a telltale sign for me. Also, you'll notice these little black specks all over the brick. 
That's bat droppings. Now bat droppings are very similar to rodent droppings in size, but shape wise, they're more jagged and they have pointed ends. Now these caps are super glued shut. Please leave them that way because we're gonna go into a second why if these open up, we all have to go to the bathroom now and clean ourselves. But you can actually take a look and see, again, similar in shape or in size to mouse droppings, but they're more jagged on the edges, they have pointed ends, and they have more of a curve to them. I say that because if any of you are in the market to buy a new home, or new to you a home, and the inspector says, small amount of mouse droppings in the attic, get a wildlife professional to inspect that attic. 60% of all bat work that Huntsman Wildlife has done in the three years we've been in Cincinnati has been for clients within 30 days of close. People are buying homes that come with bats. Now, how many people remember what I said the cheapest bat removal was? Mm -hmm. yeah. Imagine buying a new home, you're a young couple, you bought your first home, and now you've got a $4,000 bill from Huntsman Wildlife to solve for a problem you shouldn't have had. You know, so it's one of those that do not diminish the fact that I know nothing about electrical, plumbing, HVAC, so I'm not gonna do that inspection. I have no idea why Ohio does not have a requirement that wildlife inspectors inspect homes before purchase, because again, you'd be amazed at the number of clients, not just bats, but raccoons, squirrels, mice, people inherit these problems, especially in the past eight months, because buyers have been skipping inspections, don't get me started, um, but you don't wanna spend a bunch of money on a home, be it your first home or your second home, your you know, your last home, your retirement home or whatever, and find out that you inherited a wildlife issue. The other thing you're gonna look for is insect frass. Frass means parts, legs, heads, thoraxes, shells, wings. If you find a large grouping of that on your patio, uh, on your deck, a windowsill, something like that, it's because something goes there to eat every night. Um, so it's something to be aware of. Commonly, you're not gonna find frass inside your attic, but if you start seeing that on your windowsills or on your, your sidewalk or on your porch or whatever, you have bats that are coming at night. They're out feeding in your yard or in the area, and then they're consuming that food in that area. So something to be aware of that now you do know you have some pressure for bats in the area. Uh, once you figured out how they're getting in, then go back to the rest of the home looking for potential access points. That's where a pen or a number two pencil comes in handy. If you can fit a pen or a number two pencil in that gap, it's gotta get sealed. Because you can't kick the bats out of that spot where that sebaceous oil is and all those droppings. If you kick them out of there and you have an opening somewhere 100 feet to the left, they're just gonna zoom right back in and you're literally chasing tails around your home. So again, soffits, fascia, gutter drip edge, chimney, Rooftop venting, gable vents, all of those need to be checked. And then starting the exclusion process. Before you put up the devices, you need to seal everywhere. So referring back to that inspection in your home, seal anything that's a quarter inch wider. Do not, do not, do not, do not, do not use spray foam. Spray foam or canned foam is great at keeping out sunlight. That's it. That's absolutely it. Does nothing for wildlife. Wildlife have, have claws, they have teeth, they have the ability to get through spray foam like it's no tomorrow. There is a green can now of the same company makes that foam that says it's pest free. I will tell you in my 17 years of experience, I've never seen that work. Mice, bats, raccoons, squirrels, they, are, they look at foam, it's nothing more than a slight irritation and something to go through in five minutes. Spray foam does nothing. Your number of um, right here, steel fiber cloth, not Brillo pads, not steel wool from Home Depot. If you pass this around, you'll notice the fibers on this are sharper, uh, more aggressive. Your steel fiber cloth or steel wool that you buy from Home Depot, Lowe's, or your Brillo pads are meant for scrubbing, they're meant for sanding, they're meant for finishing. This is meant for cutting gums and teeth and, and paws, not to the point where they bleed, but to the point where um, they don't like it very much and they won't come back. Uh, it does not at all you know, affect the animal for its, its future, but you, know, you get a mouse or a bat or a raccoon or squirrel that wants to start ripping into that, they're gonna have a bad day and they're gonna be like, no, I'm not coming back. The other thing is, 
Uh, you'll hear sometimes about silicone. Um, I prefer to use polyurethane. So we use polyurethane in most of our seal-up jobs. Uh, a, it tends to not drip as much as silicone, um, and B, it's got more flexibility. If there's something we have definitely seen this summer here in Cincinnati, it is that our weather can change in three days and flush away from one to another. So when you have high humidity, high heat, and then you go to low humidity and high heat, and then you go to high humidity with lower temperatures, and then all of a sudden it's September, and we're 80 degrees on Tuesday, but you know by Friday we're down to 30 degrees, that's where polyurethane is gonna be a much better friend to you than, um, than silicone. So we use polyurethane sealants in everything we do. Um, and then, sorry, I almost forgot. I keep walking back and forth here. Hardware cloth or uh, mesh. Do not use chicken wire, because again, we're looking for quarter inch or smaller. So you pass that around. Um, hardware cloth is gonna be your biggest fan for stuff like your gable vents. Um, any of your ridge venting that you know is pulled up, you can put that over temporarily until you have a roofer come out. But for bats and mice, you wanna go quarter inch. You don't want the half inch, uh, and you definitely don't wanna use chicken wire. Chicken wire isn't welded. Hardware cloth is gonna be well, welded where chicken wire is twisted. I've seen raccoons and squirrels get in through chicken wire quite easily. Uh, and then once you've sealed up the entire home, that's when you put in your one-way devices. Now, some of you are gonna look at these and go, Ryan, that is nothing more than sump pump hose. You're almost correct. <laughs> so these are one-way devices. Uh, we only use bat valves. We're made by a company up in Dayton, um, Viking Product Supply. Three different options for setting things up, but the way it works is that the bats, so this gets put, say, you know, this outlet is a bat hole. We put the hole right over the cover secure this so they can't get in. The bats can exit, but they can't fly back in. Now the reason it can't fly back in is because bats cannot fly into a hole. In order to enter a structure, they have to land on it and then crawl into a hole. They're not actually gonna fly into the end of it. So we'll pass those around and let you see. The one in the T here is for you know smaller, narrower gaps. And this one is the same process, but we don't have anywhere to mount it. So we'll actually just kind of manhandle it and get it into the crevice and void. Um, but these are the best devices. Now you can make your own exclusion tube from say a silicone caulk tube, um, old you know PVC pipes, stuff like that. Really, if you're going through all the headache to do your own exclusion by the silicone, by the steel fiber cloth and all that, buy a back cone. It's so much easier than trying to make your own. Um, they are available at VikingProductSupply.line. Um, again, they're a local Ohio company. Great family business. I've known Jacob and Jack for a long time, um, ever since I was working in Minneapolis doing pest control there. After the bats have been evicted, and once you know they're out of the home, then you want to take down those bat devices and seal up those access points. You don't want to leave those up long term because it's not a permanent fix, it's just to let them out, take those back down, seal up those holes, and then this is the one point where I will tell you do not do it on your own. Do not go up in your attic to inspect it. Do not go up there to take a look at things. Hire a professional for the attic side of things. There are plenty of my friends, my family, my neighbors, who I know are perfectly capable, I'm sure some of you are, to do your own exclusion work. The cleanup work needs to be done by professionals. Those two little containers of bat droppings are probably the most dangerous thing I will ever bring to a presentation. Mainly histoplasmosis. Um, it's, it's a fungal disorder, causes flu-like systems, respiratory illness, potential blindness, and even death. Now, I always tell people bat feces, raccoon feces, is just like asbestos. It's fine if you leave it be and leave it alone, you can let it sit. You don't need to get it out tomorrow. You know, a lot of my clients have to pay us thousands of dollars in bat removal, and then they don't have the thousands of dollars to pay valley insulation to remove all the insulation, sanitize the attic, put new insulation in. So there has to be a window, a gap, and they're like, is it going to be fine? Absolutely, if you don't disturb it. Don't go walking around up there, don't turn up, you know, turn on your attic fans, stop using any sort of bathroom exhaust fans, stuff like that, and you're fine. But once you start disturbing it, that's when those fungal spores become airborne 
You breathe those in, you have a bad day. I've gotten a hiss though twice in my life. Every time I did it, I did something I shouldn't have done and that was going up into an attic that I knew potentially at bats without breathing protection. It is not that hard to get. Now it's not always death, but it will ruin you for about a week and a half. You have a very bad time. It's just not fun. Also, um, bat bugs and mites tend to go with bat colonies. Um, bat bugs are just like bed bugs. They look just like them. They don't tend to feed on humans, but they're absolutely annoying and they will make you think that you have bed bugs. Uh, and so commonly, a lot of times these pest control companies will come to treat somebody. Somebody will call, hey, I have bed bugs. They think they got it from work or run in a Uber or going on vacation. And really what it is, is it's the bat bugs are starting to come out of you know, the attic space and then the pest control company calls me and goes, hey, we got called for bed bugs, it's actually bat bugs, so then we have to get rid of the bats and deal with all that. And then mites, mites again, uh, don't tend to feed too much off of humans, but if you do have pets, they're easily transferable. Mites love dead skin, fur, hair, stuff like that. Um, so you're gonna find them in bedding areas that are roosting areas that the, the um, bats are in. Once you get those bats out, they no longer have their food source, they're going to start looking the other way other places for food sources, and that's where your cat or your dog's bedding area or sleeping area is going to start getting affected. If you happen to get a live bat inside your home, do not open your windows and doors. I'm sure you've all heard, just open a window or door, shoo it out. The number of times my mother included has thought, I'm gonna open a window or door and another bat is pulling in. <laughs> yep, it happens. It happened to my mom. My mom called me at like 10 o'clock at night, five, six years ago, and says, Ryan, you're gonna kill me. I'm like, what did you do? She's like, I had a bat in the house. I tried to get it out, and I opened the door. I'm like, how many are in now? Three. <laughs> yeah. So the problem is, is and, and this is goes back to making sure, check things around your home, like um, your screens and all that. If the bugs are getting into your home, the things that eat the bugs are gonna follow those bugs. So if it's the middle of the night and you live out in the middle of the country like I do and I have all the lights on in my house and no other light out there and all the bugs are banging up against my window, guess where the bats are going to feed? Mm -hmm. And if that screen's not working or if I don't have screens in that window, they're coming right in. So if you do have bats that get into the home, first thing you do, check all your windows and doors and close them all. And then try and quarantine or, or sequester the bat to one specific room so you're not chasing it everywhere. And the easiest thing in the world to do is grab a Tupperware container and a paper plate or a piece of cardstock, like the back of a notebook or something like that. You put the Tupperware container over the bat, slide the cardstock under. You're gonna to get to the bat's feet. It's going to scream and it's going to wail at you and say bad things in bat languages. You're not actually hurting it, it's just not happy you're doing it. You do that, you bring it outside, and then put it next to a large tree. Then take the cardboard off, let the bat hang on a tree, and then walk away. Do not put the bat on the ground. Bats do not have the wing capabilities that birds have for flight. They cannot lift themselves up. When bats fly, they drop and then fly. So they don't actually have the propulsion to get themselves off the ground. Commonly, if the bat's on the ground, it's got to find somewhere to climb to get back up to drop and then fly away. So just help the bat out. I mean, they're capable, they'll climb or they'll crawl until they find a place to get up. But while they're on the ground, they're easy picking for any sort of predator, owls, night hawks, coyote, fox, stuff like that, even opossum and raccoons. So if you do catch it at night, go up to a large tree, put it on a tree. Know perfectly darn well if you have bats in a home, that bat you put in your tree will be in your home by the end of the day, or by the end of the, the night, um, and then call a wildlife professional, but please, put them outside on, on a surface that they can hold on to. Um, but I always tell people, when it comes to the container, what they don't tell you about that online, is the minute that notebook paper, that cardstock comes in contact with their feet, they are gonna scream bloody murder, and you're gonna be like, oh my God, I'm killing it. No, they're just divas. And they just, you touch, you look at a fat weird, and it's gonna yell at you. Um, so yeah, uh, we're about to go into a couple other things, and then we'll go into the Q&A, but if you haven't already, um, fill out some questions on the top there uh, and make sure to fill out the bottom for that. Now, um, bat resources. Obviously, like I stated a couple times, the library has been kind enough to put a couple um, books out for you guys available to check out before you leave today. 
on the purple shelves there. Um, please take advantage of that. Please come back to the library and say, I learned great things about bats and want to learn more. Uh, then the library will hopefully get more books um, that you know you guys can read. Um, what's it usually take to get something from a different branch? Just a couple days? A couple days. Yeah. So if it's not necessarily here, you know, at, at Felicity, but it's in the Claremont County Library System, they can find one and get it for you. Um, again, thank you, Casey, and everyone for having us here. We're looking forward to the rest of the year. Uh, Huntsman Resources, we do have a website and blog um, that we really make, I guess, homeowner friendly. Our blog posts, I try to write them so that they are three to five minute reads. Um, I had one guy joke to me that three to five minutes is a perfect amount of time for him to sit on his favorite seat in the house. I didn't do that on purpose, um, but they are quick, easy reads. You know, if you're waiting in line for, you know, uh, McDonald's or Taco Bell at lunch, or you need something quick to read, they're great options. We do have our YouTube channel, which uh, we're trying to get more and more content and information in. So uh, we have that. We have a podcast we put out. Uh, it is more um, wildlife company focused. So working with other wildlife providers, small nuisance wildlife operators, and letting them know the system. Um, but there is some great information there. And then all of our social media. We try to post consistently on Facebook, LinkedIn, Nextdoor, uh, and Instagram. <coughs> um, and then for those of you that are keeping track of uh, your children or your grandkids we are on TikTok and oddly enough doing very well on TikTok and I have no idea why I'm 40 years old I shouldn't be on TikTok but <laughs> we've got over 100,000 people who say I should be so I'll keep doing it as long as they keep watching uh, and then lastly we do have an ebook um, that goes into a lot more details on not just bat stuff on defending your castle or protecting your home against wildlife uh, it covers stuff about bats um, obviously but it also covers mice birds, raccoons, squirrels, stuff like that. So if you do go to our website, right at the bottom of it, you're gonna see Huntsman Press. Uh, click on that. Otherwise, you can come up to the poster right there, scan the QR code with your phone, and I'll take you right there. All right, that is it for the presentation. Uh, we're gonna stop this.